Good evening. It's great to be able to worship with you and to be able to spend some time and study. Uh, as we get started tonight, let me just uh, begin with a brief introduction. My name is Pastor Mike McClung, and I am the pastor at Trinity Wesleyan Church. And I know most of you already know me, uh, but I just figured I would start with that. Uh, it is a blessing to be able to do this with you tonight. I will say that this is the second time that I have recorded this this afternoon as apparently I did not do a very good job of doing it the first time, so I'm having to go back through. Couldn't figure out how to upload everything, so I'll try to get everything out to YouTube at some point as soon as we can figure all that stuff out. So anyway, so here we are, and um, it is uh, a blessing as we do this. I will tell you that um, uh, we're one of the few churches that still does a Sunday night service, and I've had individuals ask at times why we still do our Sunday night service. Uh, one of the primary reasons is because I enjoy interaction with other people. I enjoy interaction with the church. I like uh, being able to sit and just to be able to talk with other folks. Now, I realize that in this environment, because we're doing this online, uh, that there really won't be the opportunity for as much interaction. Uh, but I really, it benefits me. It helps me. Another reason is because by the time Sunday morning comes around, I typically have enough sermon material where I could preach easily for an hour, sometimes closer to two hours. I'm not going to go for two hours tonight, so don't worry about that. But one of the problems that you run into is uh, you have so much information, you just can't share it all. Uh, so by having a service on Sunday night, uh, it actually opens up the opportunity for me to use some of what I've gained throughout the week uh, to be able to pass that on to you as well. So uh, that is the plan. Uh, actually, I typically would refer to this as the rest of the story. So uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be continuing the thoughts from this morning. Sometimes it'll be other passages that relate to whatever it was that I taught about on Sunday morning. Uh, sometimes, which tonight will be the, the this situation, uh, sometimes we'll look at other portions of the same passage. It just kind of gives us a fuller glimpse as to what is happening within the scriptures. So I uh, just want to be able to do this with you. And I really tell you the truth, I benefit from this probably as much as anybody else does, which is why we're here and why we're trying to do this tonight. I think it's just good for all of us to spend some time in God's word. Uh, normally we would do this in our choir room here at the church, uh, but I'll tell you that our choir room is a relatively small room and uh, with all the social distancing issues, we're not able to do that. Uh, so our plan would be to uh, to do this here probably for at least a couple months where we can uh, leave this as an option for individuals just to connect and to be able to spend some time getting closer to the Lord. Each time I'll try to keep it to less than 30 minutes. Uh, I know that sometimes uh, preachers can get a little long-winded. I, I guess you could say that I did a little bit this morning. I think it took about 40 minutes for me to do my sermon. Uh, I was reading a post on Facebook this past week from a pastoral friend, and he said that the average preacher typically preaches for 40 minutes or longer. Uh, he went on to, to make this comment, and it makes so much sense. 40 minutes is probably too long most of the time. He said it is better for a preacher to preach a shorter sermon and leave the congregation longing for more than for a preacher to preach a longer sermon and have the congregation wishing that he was done already. So my goal is to keep it within the 30 minutes. I don't want to go too long for you, uh, but it's an opportunity just for all of us to grow together. So as we get started tonight, I do want to start with a time of prayer. We've typically tried to uh, pray before each one of our activities. We'll also pray at the end. Uh, there are some specific needs that individuals have mentioned uh, that have, they've asked for some specific prayers. Uh, so we'll, we'll pray for those things right now as well. Maybe you have some prayers as well, uh, some things that you need to be praying and asking God for. This would be a great time to do it. Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, we are grateful for all that you do. Uh, we're grateful for who you are. We're grateful for the grace that you extend to us. Uh, right now we come before you and we ask that you would... Um, speak to our hearts. There are many needs that are very real to us. There are people that are broken all around us. And we do ask that you would perform miracles, that you would fix the physically broken. 
I think of Sylvia today who is dealing with cancer, and I pray that your hand would be upon her, that you would bring healing. I pray that your grace would be sufficient for her as she walks this journey. I pray for Ronald Maul. I ask that you would touch his body as he continues to heal up from his shoulder surgery. I pray that you would uh, just continue to walk with him. Thank you for the progress that has taken place over the last week. Uh, it is amazing how quickly he is turning around, but I just pray that that would continue and pray that as he does continue to improve, uh, that you would help him to get back to normal. I know that uh, uh, he is an incredible blessing and we're just praying that he would uh, be able to get back and be able to get out again very, very soon. I uh, pray that you continue to be with Adam, uh, the young man that we've been praying for here at the church who has had some physical ailments and uh, uh, he needs a special touch from you. Thank you that you've already done a great work over the last week uh, to get him out of the hospital, to get him back home, and we pray that that would just continue. I pray for extra strength for his wife and for his children, uh, that you would allow them to be a blessing and a support during this time, and uh, again, just pray that your hand would continue to be upon him, and I uh, pray that you continue to be with Margaret Poor, and uh, we know that she is grieving the loss of her husband. And we pray that you would just encourage her today. And uh, thank you for the grace that you extend to us when we do have to walk through times like that. I pray for our nation tonight and pray that you would just uh, uh, heal the brokenness that's there in that capacity. Uh, there's so much division. There are so many things that have taken place that uh, we're not very proud of those things. And we want to see those things change so we ask that you would begin that process. I pray that you would uh, be with all of our governing officials. I pray that you give them wisdom, whether they be Democrat or Republican. May they be led by your spirit. And I pray that uh, whether it's their intention or not, I pray that your will would be done through them. And again, I thank you that uh, none of our leaders surprise you. Uh, it's not as if you're pulling for one and pulling against the other. You're the one who put them in these positions. So I pray that you would use them to accomplish your work, and I pray that as you do, that our nation would become a better place. But we know that our hope is not found in politicians. Our hope is found in you. So we pray that you would help us today to seek you, to experience revival like we never have before. I pray that it would begin within the church, within the body of Christ, within those who are participating even this evening, and I pray that it would spread throughout the rest of our nation. I pray that you would bring unity where there is disunity today. Bring peace where there is unrest today. I pray that you would allow us as a nation to be changed, starting with the people of God. I pray for our police officers who are out serving to protect us, who are sacrificing themselves by putting them in dangerous positions simply for the well-being of their community. And I pray today that you would put a hedge of protection around them. I pray that you would help them uh, every single moment to know that they do not go alone. I pray that we would be the body of Christ that would support them and encourage them and that you would help us uh, to uh, really lift them up during this time, maybe through prayer, maybe reaching out to them, uh, simply letting them know that we love them. I pray that you would hold them to a high standard, that they would live in such a way and work in such a way that they would truly represent the Spirit of God in them. Uh, Lord, I, I know that not every one of them is a Christian, but I know that there are some incredible officers who simply want to be a blessing. Make them a blessing. I pray that you would use them in whatever way that you would see fit. Again, we thank you for all that you do for us, and I do pray that you would speak to us during this time tonight. I pray that you would use this for your glory, and in everything we will give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, it's great to be able to uh, do this with you, and as we do, we're going to continue this morning. I talked about James chapter 3, so we're going to be there again tonight, but in James chapter 3, uh, we only focus this morning on what is uh, really the value of us uh, taming the tongue. Uh, James talks extensively about it. He begins by talking about uh, individuals being teachers and how that really shouldn't be a desirable thing because when you become a teacher the things that you say will be held to a higher standard and by the way that does fit with cultural expectations as well uh, obviously the scriptures do deal with that and God is going to hold us accountable for the things that we say and he expects much of those who have been given much therefore if you're a teacher you need to take that responsibility very seriously 
But in addition to that, even the world around us expects more from those who teach, those who lead. In some cases, they preach. Sometimes it may be with their families, maybe with a schoolroom full of classes, full of students. Uh, whatever that looks like for you, if you're a teacher, you should expect you're going to be held to a higher standard. So uh, let's just begin here. This is just a logic thing. Uh, we need to be a people that we don't need to be ashamed of the things that we say. Make sure that if you're going to be a teacher, that you live up to that standard. So anyways, that's where James began. And then he talked about taming the tongue and how it's very difficult. And we looked at some examples of how uh, the untamed tongue can become a stumbling block. Uh, you have those who will bear false witness. You have those who will speak vulgar terms, idle words. You have those who are violent with their words, and they've said things that have hurt people. So all of those things are uh, present in James chapter 3. But we stopped at verse 12, and really that was all about the tongue. Let me suggest to you that verses 13 through 18, which we're going to look at tonight, do tie very closely in with James chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. So if you would, I'm going to go ahead and read to you James 3, verse 13 to 18. If you want to read along with me, that's great. I'm going to read from the New International Version. I recognize that not everybody reads from the NIV, and truthfully, I don't have a huge preference, uh, so I'm not telling you what you're reading is more right or wrong than another. My personal preference probably would be the New Living Translation, uh, I call that the Bible for dummies just because it's easy for me to understand. So if you want to read along in the New Living Translation, you can see how it's worded a little bit different. I have typically preached out of the NIV just because of the fact that there are more people in the church that have an NIV Bible. Uh, I love the beauty that's in the King James Version or the New King James Version, whichever version you read. Uh, man, that's great. Just make sure that you stay faithful to the Word of God. Uh, so anyways, tonight I'm reading from the NIV, and we're in James chapter 3, and we're just going to look at verses 13 through 18, and this is what it says. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, and he uses quotation marks around wisdom, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. As we look at this passage, I want you to recognize that it does very much connect with what we looked at this morning. Obviously, this morning we talked about the importance of words, and the words that we speak do matter. But it's not just what you say, but it's also what you do. I remember years ago I had a pastor who uh, he said that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And what he was actually saying there is you can be the most intelligent teacher in the world. You can be impressive in all of the knowledge that is there. But if you do not genuinely love the people, then your words are just empty words. So let me begin with this. It is very important for us to recognize, and verse 13 really does deal with this. It is not just what you say, but it's what you do. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Know that the good deeds matter. God cares about the good deeds that we do. He expects us to actually live it and not just speak it. He goes on and then he begins to talk in verse 14 about envy and selfish ambition. The problem so often for us is that too often we say and what we say and what we do are driven by false motives. And what I mean by that is sometimes we say something because we know that's what we're supposed to say. Uh, we do something because we know that's what we should do. 
but it's really not what's in our heart. Sometimes we may say something that is nice because it's the right thing to say, but deep down inside, it's not what we mean. And often what happens is the heart does not measure up with the things that are really coming out of us through our actions or through our words. Uh, we need to be people who genuinely what comes out of us is what's in our heart. Uh, one of the things we talked about this morning, it really does tie in with this tonight, is uh, there are many times that we have, we have, I want to say this in a way that is very encouraging to the body of Christ. I think at times we have not really been the people that we're supposed to be, and we've tried to clean up the good things in our lives. We want to make them better. We want to make sure that we live in the right way, but our heart's not really in it. What we need to begin with is getting our heart right with God and then allowing him to change not only the words that we say, but the actions that we take. Um, wisdom of this world, I want you to catch, is very different from wisdom from God. I mentioned that as we got to the word wisdom of the world, that the term wisdom was actually in quotation marks tonight. Uh, part of the reason for that is because the wisdom of God is very different from the wisdom of our world. The wisdom of God is typically going to be something that is supernatural in a way. It, it gives us a knowledge or an understanding that is beyond what we normally could figure out on our own. The wisdom of the world is often not really wisdom at all. We call it wisdom, but it's not really wisdom. The rest of the world thinks something, and therefore we think it. The rest of the world seems to point in this direction, so it must be logical, it must be wise. But the truth is, wisdom of this world is not the same as the wisdom that comes from God. In fact, often the wisdom of this world works contrary to what the wisdom of God would actually teach us. As we look at verses 15 and 16, it talks about the uh, evil practices, every evil practice. It talks about the selfish ambition. Uh, let me read a quote from you that comes from the Reformation Study Bible. Now, I'm going to tell you that this quote was written long before the events that have taken place just over the last several weeks. It says this. This is specifically regarding verses 15 and 16. It says, as James earlier showed that the tongue is capable of creating disastrous evil, so here he emphasizes the destructive power of envy and selfish ambition. From them flow all kinds of evil, including vandalism, murder, adultery, warfare, theft, slander, and other sins that violate people and provoke chaos in the community. Now, I got to tell you, that could have been describing the things that have happened in our nation just over the last month or so. Uh, I will begin by saying that there have been injustices that have taken place in our nation for a long time. Unfortunately, the things that people are standing up to fight against today, many of them have been issues for a long time. And it is a good thing for people to stand up against injustice. But when we turn to all of these kinds of evil, vandalism, murder, adultery, warfare, theft, slander, and other sins that violate people and provoke chaos in the community, we cannot pretend that what we are doing has anything to do with wisdom. The truth is, the things that have happened over the last month or so do not represent Christ well. And I know that there are those even in the church that have embraced certain aspects of this. But the truth is, this does not reflect the Spirit of God. Again, there are legitimate issues that need to be addressed. I do not have a problem with that. In fact, I believe that as the body of Christ, we should be speaking up for the truth. When we see injustice, we need to speak up. We need to be the people of God that we are called to be. There is absolutely no objection to that. But my concern is that often the body of Christ has actually been open to some of these things that we think are wise because other people think it's wise. And it has nothing to do with the wisdom of God. Actually, it has to do with all kinds of evil. It doesn't belong in the life of a believer. 
Well, we see that as the wisdom of the world. I want to talk about the wisdom that comes from God, and I want to read verses 17 and 18 to you one more time just to help us with that. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. First thing I will say here is that I do think that order matters. And as James writes, he begins by identifying that first of all, when individuals have wisdom that comes from God, it says is, it is first of all something that is pure. Let me suggest to you that when we have pure hearts, when everything in our lives is in line with Jesus Christ, when the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us, when purity is what it's supposed to be, all of these other things will take care of itself. The truth is we need to be living pure lives where the rest of the world looks upon us and they see something as different, not just because we're smarter than everybody else, because the truth is we're not. Although we do have wisdom that is available to us from God. We need to be a people that genuinely show the love of God in everything that we say and do. And when we truly are pure in our actions and in our attitudes, you'll find it a whole lot easier to do all of this other stuff that's talked about here with the wisdom of God. So there's intentionality here when we begin with being pure, making sure that our heart is right. If your heart is not right with God, then now is the time to fix that. I can't speak. I don't even know all of the people that are on this video feed right now. What I will tell you is more than likely some of us are not truly operating with a pure heart. And what we're going to need to do is to begin right now by purifying our own hearts. Uh, we find in Revelation a great description of how to make that happen. It tells us to buy from God, gold refined in the fire, something purified. If you truly want to be pure, we're going to have to come before him. And we're going to have to allow him to purify us, to change who we are, not on the outside. That's going to come secondary. He wants to begin by purifying our hearts, and that will feed everything else. So let me just begin with that. I think that it's intentional that as James writes, he starts with this call for purity. Then he adds to it, peace-loving, being considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit. He talks about being impartial and sincere, and I'll come back to that issue of being impartial in just a minute. I want to talk a little bit about being peacemakers because it's actually mentioned twice here. Uh, being peace-loving, that's the second one that is mentioned. And then in verse 18, it says, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. I think it's important for us to understand that God intends us to be people of peace. We need to be individuals who bring peace to others. When there is brokenness around us, we need to be the ones who come to the table and we do whatever it takes to make peace happen. I know that we can't, make, we can't force people into peace, but we can at least do our part. I'm reminded of the words from Jesus in the, um, uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 9. It's part of his Sermon on the Mount. He says, Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Let me suggest to you that if you are truly a child of God, you will be a peacemaker. Uh, the flip side of that is as you bring peace, you reflect the God who lives within you. So it is really important that we be peacemakers. In addition, uh, in the book of Romans, Paul is writing, and he says in chapter 12, verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. Know that you cannot always make peace, but as much as it depends on you, make sure that you live at peace with other individuals. Make sure that you have done everything you can. Maybe you've got some baggage. Maybe you're not living at peace with somebody else right now. Maybe there's something you've said that, man, you wish you could take it back. That's what we talked about this morning, having those regrets, trying to get those words back in your mouth. It doesn't happen. Maybe what you need to do is to go make peace with someone. 
Maybe you need to apologize. I've heard individuals say, well, you know, I said I'm sorry, so I've done my part. Now it's on them. Uh, maybe, maybe that's enough. Maybe not. Maybe you're going to need to do more than just say you're sorry. Maybe you're going to have to reach out to them. You're going to have to love on them. Maybe you're going to have to do something that simply says, hey, you know what? This is not who I am, and I don't like the idea of us not being at peace. So what's it going to take for us to be at peace again, to bring forgiveness and reconciliation? As much as it depends on you, try to live at peace with everyone. I believe that God wants us to live at peace. Now, I mentioned I would come back to it, so I don't want to skip it. Um, but James also calls us, he tells us that when we have a God-driven wisdom, we will also be impartial and sincere. Now, the term impartial means to treat everyone equally. Uh, that doesn't mean that I dislike everyone equally. Uh, it's actually the other way around. Instead, it means that I'm going to love you regardless of who you are. And I'm going to treat you like I would if you were family. I'm going to treat you like I would if you were someone who had done something nice for me in the past. I'm going to treat you like you're a child of God because you know what? We all share an awful lot. We were all created in the same image, the image of God. And God desires that we act like we're family. Whether I necessarily agree with everything that someone else teaches, everything else someone else stands for, I can still be respectful and I can still love them and I can appreciate who they are. Uh, know that God desires for all of us to live at peace, but that means that we're going to have to love unconditionally even those that maybe aren't just like us. I believe today that if we genuinely will have that pure heart that puts God where he is supposed to be, then the words that come from our mouths will be pure and they will be uplifting. They will honor God. I believe that if we have that pure heart, the actions that flow out of us also will be that way. We need to be people who check constantly to make sure our hearts are where they need to be. If, if your heart is in need of repair tonight, I want to challenge you to come before the Lord. He is gracious and he will forgive and he will make things right. I just invite you right now to make things right with him. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, as we come before you tonight, we are grateful for your mercy. We're grateful for your love and for your grace. We have all fallen short in all of these areas at some point or another. We've said things we shouldn't have said. We've done things we shouldn't have done. We've displayed attitudes that do not reflect you. And I pray right now that you would change our hearts. Make us pure. Allow us to see you and to constantly seek you. And as we do, I pray that you would make us incredible world changers who will take the brokenness of our world and introduce them to the restoration that is available through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray today that you would fill us, that this week we would be the light and the hope to the people around us. I have no idea the things we're going to face tomorrow, but I pray that what we've talked about tonight will help us to live at peace with whatever it is and to know that you are faithful and you're going to work in the midst of it. May you be honored in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you again for taking the time to participate with us tonight. It is truly a blessing to me. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of this tonight, this is the second time I've recorded this today. So I'm hoping that uh, you will have benefited as much as I have. Maybe you need to go back and watch it twice, just like I had to do it twice. So thank you for being a part of this tonight. And we'll do this again on uh, Wednesday night at seven o'clock. We're working through the book of Joshua on Wednesday nights. And then we're going to continue to do this rest of the story stuff here on Sunday night. So next Sunday at 6 o'clock and on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Thank you for being with us tonight, and I hope you have a great week.